at Meridian. Uh, now I have, again, the honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who certainly needs no introduction. He has been called one of America's precious few master strategists, a key architect of America's Cold War strategy and global visionary. Dr. Brzezinski is prominently featured in Mr. Tan Goes to Washington, the film we're about to see. As President Jimmy Carter's National Security Advisor from 1977 to 1981, he played a pivotal role in normalizing U.S.-China relations by advising President Carter to make the leap and establish that most important bilateral relationship. Dr. Brzezinski would also establish a close working, if not personal, relationship with Deng Xiaoping to iron out the details of the 1979 joint communique, normalizing relations. Dr. Brzezinski has advised, I believe, five presidents in addition to President Jimmy Carter on foreign policy, on global affairs. Currently, I think you all want to know what he's doing. A counselor and trustee at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and co-chair of the CSIS Advisory Board, he also works, still works as a research, um, research um, expert uh, at the Johns Hopkins uh, Advanced International Studies University, alma mater of Ambassador Tsui. Dr. Brzezinski, you are still as active and relevant as when you were work brokering the Camp David peace accords between Israel and Egypt or negotiating the normalization of relations with China. Let me just cite the New York Times and help promote your books. And I quote, in his 1993 book, out of control, global turmoil on the eve of the 21st century. Dr. Brzezinski argued that the acceleration of communication made possible by technology set contemporary history apart from the past, that China was more likely than Russia to assume a leadership role on the world stage. Remember, this is 1993. And that America's emphasis, and I, I quote, material wealth on consumption and on the propagation of self-indulgence as the definition of the good life could endanger its preeminence as a global power. Again, remember, this is 1993. Now in his latest book, Strate Strategic Vision, America and the Crisis of Global Power, Dr. Brzezinski, and I quote, provides a clear-eyed, sharp-tongued assessment of this hinge moment in time, when the world's center of gravity is shifting from the west to the east. Dr. Brzezinski, we all look forward to your stories about Mr. Mr. Dunn and your vision of the legacy he and you bestowed on this generation and the next for U.S.-China relations going forward. Dr. Brzezinski. Madam Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special evening for me because it brings back memories that at one time dominated my life and engaged me in truly a great geopolitical adventure. How to change the American-Chinese relationship from hostility and stalemate 
into something which would be far more constructive. My predecessors in the United States worked and made that beginning possible. And I have in mind, of course, my colleagues under the Republican administration, in which particularly Henry Kissinger played an eminent role. But this was a special opportunity. We were going to normalize relations. And that decision was made basically in the course of a visit which I paid to Beijing and in which I engaged in a protracted dialogue with the leader of China, Deng Xiaoping, who struck me as being very direct, very strong, very outspoken, quite challenging, and yet able to establish points of contact and act eventually in unison to accomplish a truly momentous historical change in the strategic realities of the world. We had serious disagreements at some stages, but increasingly narrowed the disagreements and focused on the possibility of a real breakthrough. But I remember especially an evening in which we had supper together and in which he said to me wistfully that he wasn't sure if he will live long enough to accomplish what we were already talking about. And in a moment of instant inspiration, I said to him, I'm convinced it's going to be sooner than you think. And what I would like to suggest is that if it happens, you come to dinner to my house. Well, what did happen? On the day he arrived as the head of the Chinese delegation, the leader of China, to visit the United States, and to particularly visit the President of the United States, he and his wife came to my house for dinner, a private dinner. And at that dinner, we had a chance to talk about many things, including the suffering that he and his immediate family experienced during the great, uh, what was it called, People's Revolution? Uh, what? Cultural revolution, culture. It wasn't very cultured, but it was a revolution. <laughs> and it was at the end of that evening that we felt confident that the breakthrough would take place. And indeed, it started immediately the next day in formal discussions between the president of China and the president of the United States. But I do remember that some of my colleagues in the government were a little bit unhappy about this arrangement. But there was nothing they could do. The leader of China was willing to come, and we were more than happy to provide hospitality and to establish a personal relationship in this process. And that left an important impression on me, namely that this was a man who was in many respects both adventurous and very intelligent about the changes that China would be experiencing. For he knew that an accommodation with the United States was not only the determination of a conflict that was risky to both sides, but it was also the beginning of a possible outcome that would make both countries more comfortable, more secure, and in the case of China, particularly open the doors to modernization. So that was a very special and meaningful moment for me in dealing with him, and I want to stress that. And in stressing it, I want to make a big leap forward to the present. We have to recognize the fact that we're now living in a political system, a worldwide system, which is experiencing a very serious crisis. It is uncertain how this crisis will evolve, but it is potentially threatening to the well-being of both sides, indeed to the well-being of global stability. And on whom rests the responsibility to respond? More than anyone, the United States and China. These are the two leading agents of change in the world. And if we manage to strike a process to launch an effort to consolidate global conditions, to address some of the problems that are confronting us. I personally have very little doubt that Russia will have no choice but to follow. 
an American Chinese accommodation on dealing with the immediate problems of the world and trying to control the forces of chaos and violence will give Russia no choice. For Russia not to join the United States and China in this undertaking would be an act of political suicide, ultimately. And the Russians have common sense. In fact, the regime is no longer communist. Without official announcements, communism really has disappeared in Russia. What is left behind is a series of uncertitudes as to whether diplomacy can be established, a diplomacy which will dominate the process and make the accommodation wider, or whether it will be a risk of some confrontations. But I am confident that if China and the United States work together, the dominant position in Russia will be to become part of this effort. And this is why it's so important that we, and you, the Chinese, but also the Russians, be given the opportunity to work together to create something in the world that can endure at a time of great change. And some more changes coming, because before too long, the political problems we confront will be also linked to the increasing evidence that global conditions more generally, in terms of physical realities, will get worse because of deterioration in the global condition in general. So this challenge for us is an enormous one. We have to meet it together. My experience leads me to conclude that we will meet it together. And I'm almost confident that we will prevail. Thank you. Live at Meridian.